Welcome to the Salk Institute's Where Cures Begin podcast, where scientists talk about breakthrough discoveries with your hosts, Ali Akmal and Brittany Fair. I'm here today with Professor Ron Evans, who is director of Salk's Gene Expression Laboratory and the March of Dimes Chair in Molecular and Developmental Biology. As a molecular endocrinologist, he studies hormones, both their normal activities and their roles in disease. Professor Evans, welcome to Where Cures Begin. Thanks for having me here, Ali. Appreciate it. You're known for your discovery of a large family of molecules called nuclear hormone receptors. That's not nuclear as in nuclear bomb. Can you tell us what it refers to and what nuclear hormone receptors are? Well, nuclear receptors basically are receptors for common hormones, such as steroid hormones, estrogen, androgens. Uh, cortisone, the anti-inflammatory molecule, sometimes people put that on their skin to reduce itching and that sort of thing. These are all hormones and they act in the nucleus of a cell, which is why we call them nuclear hormone receptors. So okay. it's not like a nuclear bomb, but rather the information that they uh, act on is in the nucleus. So we call them nuclear receptors. Hormones like estrogen, testosterone, or the thyroid hormone, thyroxin, are genetic switches that control almost every aspect of growth and metabolism in humans. In a cell, once a hormone attaches to a nuclear hormone receptor, the switch is flipped and genes start turning on. We'll hear a little later about how the Evans Lab discovered the first nuclear hormone receptor in 1985. But first, we'll explore some of the lab's more recent discoveries. One of the um, very exciting breakthroughs you had about nuclear hormone receptors was um, a genetic switch called PPAR delta. And your discovery was that this switch can turn on genes that usually require physical exercise, like training for a marathon. And in reading about this, it was just really hard for me to get my mind around the fact that a genetic switch could accomplish something that would normally take you know, sort of a physical act on, on a person's part. Can you explain why that's possible? PPR delta is one of 48 nuclear receptors. We discovered it in 1995. Uh, like other nuclear receptors, it resides in the nucleus waiting for a signal. Hmm. Um, and the signal that it responds to is actually common dietary fats. These typically comprise 20% of your daily calories a day. Mm -hmm. People don't often think of what they eat as really controlling body function, but in this case, it does. Now, PPAR delta is a metabolic switch in the presence of uh, dietary fats, uh, is activated, uh, and will begin the process of burning fat. What we discovered is if we made a chemical that is a compound that is not a fat, but that is able to activate the receptor. And we just screened for drugs basically in our lab and found uh, chemicals that are not fats, but they, they mimic fats. And when they bind to PPR delta, they activate it. And so what happens is that just like in normal exercise, when PPR delta is activated, these compounds that we call exercise mimetics, they activate the same genetic network as real exercise. Hmm. And the muscle doesn't know what's causing it to turn on. It just is turned on. I want to emphasize what Evans is saying here. When we exercise, various genes are activated. Genes that help us burn fat, for example. But a chemical compound made by the Evans lab was able to activate the same genes that would normally be activated by exercise, but without requiring any exercise. It was essentially exercise in a pill. And so as a result, if you give a mouse, let's say, a injection or in their food, the, the compound every day mm -hmm. or one injection a day, but you, in another case, you exercise mice every day. At the end of a month of training a mouse on a treadmill, they can increase their running performance about 90%, almost double. Now we take mice that didn't get any exercise, but we gave them our pill. 
every day, once a day. And those mice actually could go to 100%, that is double the other mouse that was getting trained. So they basically behave very similar to training, almost identical. Training or the drug gave you the same benefit in terms of improving performance. Now, your research on this has been done in mice. Is your sense that it should work the same way in humans? Well, first of all, we know it's going to work the same way in humans because hundreds, maybe thousands of humans are taking it, most, mostly athletes, all, about, all the time. The, the Russians got caught used doing this uh, as a big scandal, mm -hmm. uh, especially when Russia was hosting the Olympics. Russia is facing a doping scandal. The country shocking the world this week over allegations of state-sponsored athletics doping. The World Anti-Doping Agency claims... Uh, but in fact, it will it work in people? Uh, but we already have two different forms of the drug that are in new trials in, in people, and those trials are up and running. Oh, great. So clinical trials. With uh, this drug um, and uh, two, two different drugs, one for kidney disease, type of kidney disease, and another for kids with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Did you find when you were doing the, the work in mice that, that mice lost weight when they were on the drug as well? So could this be, be beneficial for obesity? Well, that's a very spot on question. And exactly that's what happens because the main source for getting the energy for the muscle to burn when you give PPR delta is the adipose tissue. Oh. Um, and muscle and fat communicate very well with each other. And so when the muscle gets a signal to burn fat, the muscle gets a signal to release it. And so we do find that uh, the mice are getting the drug do lose weight, even mm. though they're not exercising. Wow. Uh, and so that's another benefit. We also find that if, if those mice are on high fat diets or they have any signs of diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, that it lowers blood sugar as well. Wow. So lots of benefits, it seems like. It's, it's, these are benefits because what muscle likes to burn is sugar and fat. Mm -hmm. And so when you activate that program, it mostly wants to burn fat, but of course, mm -hmm. it's happy to burn sugar as well. Mm -hmm. So these are, and these are two things that you really want to keep at low levels naturally in your blood. You don't want to have high lipids. You mm -hmm. don't want to have high sugar. But these high energy compounds, while you need them to be stored safely, you don't want them in your blood for a long time uh, because they're reactive with other kinds of molecules. And so basically, it's one of the reasons why diabetes is a problem because you have chronically high sugar and sugar then interacts with other proteins. Uh, your lab actually, along these lines, just published a really exciting paper about a new stem cell based therapy for type one diabetes. Type one or juvenile diabetes occurs in typically in kids, although it can occur in adults as well. And it's an autoimmune disease where the part of the body attacks, immune system attacks the uh, cells in the pancreas called islets. Mm -hmm. And the islets are the insulin producing cells. They're called beta cells. If you have type 1 diabetes, the cells that produce insulin, the beta cell, is gone. So you have no way of controlling your glucose. And in adults with type 2 diabetes, which is linked to obesity uh, typically, that cell, because of the obesity, is working overtime 24 7. And it basically just fades out, it's just overworked ah. and becomes less and less efficient. And now your lab has developed synthetic islets, which you call hylos. What were the challenges in developing them? Stem cell technology has long been thought to be uh, a way to create new kinds of therapy for people. And it's, it's held this promise of being able to create healthy new cells as replacements. But it's been very difficult to actually make that happen. And, and what we did is using stem cell technology is we created cell clusters that come from basically a generic human cell. It's an FDA approved human cell. It's called an embryonic stem cell, but we can do it from any cell. What we did basically use a series of what are protocols or methods to take that sort of generic cell and encourage it to move and progress down a series of steps that transforms it 
Mm-hmm. And one of the problems with the existing protocols, all of them, every single one, mm-hmm. is that it does produce beta cells that make insulin, okay. but those cells don't respond to sugar. They don't release the insulin. They just sit there happily smiling at you saying, <laughs> I'm a beta cell. I'm loaded <laughs> with insulin, but I'm not giving it up. Uh-huh. And so that doesn't help. Okay. And what we discovered is through molecular genetic uh, analysis is that the cells that work have sort of an energy switch. Think of it as you, you've built a house, but uh, you go in and there's no light switches. So in night, it's just completely dark. Uh, uh-huh. right? It's like, okay, you got ex- the beautiful house that you want, but you can't live in it really. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. So we, what we basically found is a molecular light switch. It's a nuclear hormone receptor. Again, one that we discovered, I uh, hate to say it, back in 1988. And it's able to release the insulin from the cell very quickly, just like a normal islet would do that. Uh-huh. Uh, and insulin is now in the bloodstream. Okay. Uh, and so we had a, this is a major advance. The, discovering the power switch was key. That essentially you might call turbocharges the whole process. And the other previous cells were kind of in idle. They were there. They just couldn't get anywhere. The secret was having the right nuclear receptor. And so that's the first part of this advance that we've made. And the second was that the reason that kids have this problem of type 1 diabetes is their own body is rejecting beta cells with the immune system. The immune mm-hmm. system is on attack. Okay. So if you put new beta cells in, even if they're functional, mm-hmm. it's going to take them out. Mm. Everyone you put in will be taken out basically that day. There are medical protocols that transplant these beta cells into people and their own immune system destroys them. So they, they can't really function. That's correct. The challenge with that kind of rescue is that you have to be on immunosuppressives for the rest of your life. Oh, gosh. Because you're getting foreign cells uh-huh. and the body is just going to reject it very quickly. And so it can work, but then you have to have this immune suppression going on. Okay. So what we did is understanding that the immune system was going to take cells out, especially if you're putting a human cell in a mouse. And what we did to address that problem is we created a kind of a molecular shield that is an immune protection shield. You put it on and the cells become invisible to the immune system. These uh, synthetic islets, even though they're human, start rescuing diabetes in diabetic mice with human insulin mm-hmm. on the day that we introduce them into the mouse. Wow. And they keep going mm-hmm. day after day after day, 10 days, 20 days, 30, 40, 50 days uh, in great glucose control. Uh, that it was completely rescued by a human cell in a mouse without a device. Wow. And so that means that because the cells are not rejected, and it's very uh, challenging to get the cell not to be rejected, but it means we've kind of solved two major problems, which is why this new technology is really, I, I would say, a major step forward in trying to create a potential cure for type 1 diabetes. So we're, we would like to gear this up to be able to get to people soon, which is challenging. Can you scale it up? We're now rescuing diabetes in a mouse. A human is a lot bigger than a mouse. And so can you produce you know, a thousand times more and can they all be quality control? We'll be back in just a moment. If you like this interview and want to hear others, be sure to subscribe. For instance, you might enjoy hearing about the power of stem cells in Season 1, Episode 6. And if you'd like to get regular updates about Salk discoveries, sign up for our monthly newsletter at salk.edu slash news. Now I'd like to switch gears and ask how you got interested in science to begin with. Oh, you're going back now 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So I was always interested in science. And so that, that it may not 
be surprising. And as I went into it, my dad was a physician, although I have to say he was the first person in his family to go to college. Oh, wow. And the only person for a long time until my brother and I then went to college as well. So Evans got his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UCLA at the start of the molecular biology era, an era that has revolutionized the study of genetics. My interest was, was in gene control, trying to understand how the logic of genomic activity is regulated. Mm -hmm. I studied viruses. I'm a virologist by training, RNA viruses like coronavirus. Uh, then I did DNA viruses for my postdoc. After completing his postdoctoral training at Rockefeller University, Evans came to Salk as an assistant professor and switched from working on viral genes to working on cellular genes. I thought cellular genes could be the, the goal for mm -hmm. gene expression. Mm -hmm. And I decided to work on two receptors that were genetic regulators. One's called the glucocorticoid receptor, and okay. the other's called the thyroid hormone receptor. Mm -hmm. And so one's a steroid receptor, and one's a receptor of thyroid hormone, which is a modified amino acid. Thyroid hormone controls basal metabolic rate, controls your temperature, it controls your heart rate, it controls your alertness. Uh, glucocorticoids control sugar. That's the glucose part in, in the name. That's the major trigger for the fight or flight response. But the way they work is strictly controlling genes. And I thought if I could get one of these two genetic regulators for hormones, because you, the advantage of these is you can turn them on and off with the hormone. The steroid, the genes turns on and take it away, the gene goes off. And so I set my sights on. Isolating these receptors, there were no manuals for it. I knew how to do RNA sequencing before we came. Uh, and no one else that was working on it had these tools. And because of that, I had an intrinsic advantage. Um, I also had a, a double bonus is that I used the network of people to help uh, advance what I wanted to do. And uh, in relatively short time, we were able to get the first steroid receptor called the glucocorticoid receptor. And I won't go through all the details of that, but uh -huh. basically that was a landmark in the hormone field, having the first hormone receptor. We've had the hormones for basically a hundred years, but no one had the target. When Evans talks about isolating the first hormone receptor, he means identifying the gene for it within DNA. And knowing what the exact DNA sequence of the gene was, was a big deal because it was a familiar sequence. This suggested genes for other hormone receptors might be similar and could also be found within the genome. And so we then said there's gotta be more out there. Uh, and very quickly, they won't go through a lot of the details, we discovered that there were quite a few unnamed receptors in the genome Thyroid had been discovered, you know, back in 1914 and glucocorticoids in 1920 uh, and retinoids in 1915. These molecules had been known. Basically, all of the classic endocrine hormones were known uh, 50 to 60 years ago. No one had the targets. And they, everyone thought the targets would all be different. Uh -huh. But in fact, they're all just variants of each other. Mm -hmm. And that led to what I call a superfamily of receptors. You've obviously found a lot to keep you excited in going into the lab every day. Do you have hobbies or activities that you do that are not about science? I'm not a great tennis player, but I love playing tennis. Uh, so being physically active, but another big hobby of mine was planting flowers. Oh, um, okay. I like to plant. I, mean, I used to come home from lab every day and have a setup where I would have you know, a pot, something to plant, soil. And before I come in, I just go out to the planting area and plant a plant. And that's, I really like dirt and getting into the, the feel of the earth kind of thing. And still do that. Still do. I don't plant every day, but do a lot of planting. You um, must have an incredible garden. 
Well, you know, my wife is really avid about that as well. So we, it's a shared kind of passion. The other thing is, I mean, I play guitar. Guitar is the instrument that I've adopted since I was, you know, a young teenager. I played many kinds of, they're all basically acoustic. I mean, I have two electric guitars, but mostly learned it as acoustic guitar and mostly in the kind of, in that learning phase, like the James Taylor and Bob Dylan and that kind of, you know, and Paul Simon kind of thing. I just love the, all of your personalities, different sounds, different feel. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, again, endlessly interesting. And, but when you're playing music, you can't have anything else in your brain. It just takes you offline completely. You have to be really present. You have to be present. And it really is a way to unplug mm -hmm. um, from one thing. And it's a surefire trick. It always works. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Um, and mostly I like to play for myself, but it, I'm starting a little bit more for other people. I used to not want to do it, but I had a heart problem a couple of years ago and that I didn't, wasn't aware of. I was just getting weaker and weaker and dizzier and dizzier. Uh, and I was fainting. I was having all sorts of cancellations on trips. I mean, I was getting one of many, many doctors. They couldn't figure out what it was, but it turned out to be uh, that my right coronary artery shut down completely. Oh, wow. Um, not my knowing it, but because I work out all the time and play tennis all the time, I had these collateral vessels that came in to help rescue that right side, but it was still getting weaker and weaker and finally when i had to go for open heart surgery wow they unplugged three additional parts and my brain came back online i suddenly had like twice as much oxygen oh my gosh and so after that it's funny but i started playing guitar more for people as well uh, and it was one of my ways to get out of the harshness of surgery somehow i think the heart and heart surgery is different than other organs it may not be fair to other people that surgery, but, but there's so many things about the heart, you know, it's like heart belt and healing your heart, yeah. with heart warming. Um, so and, metaphorical, you know, warms the cockles of my heart mm -hmm. and the heart of the matter, all these things in which you don't have it for any other organ. You don't have the liver, you know, your, <laughs> or, right. or your pancreas or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was very philosophical to have the surgery and the recovery. Uh, and I do feel that the benefit of having it is that you think more deeply about yourself uh, and life. Um, and so the, the gift is that, you, you know, I appreciate things more. So, uh, you know, there's always in everything that's bad. There's always something that, that's good. And guitar got linked into all that. We've covered so much ground today. It's been fascinating. Is there is there anything you'd like to add that I didn't ask about? One of the things that, that I, I think about is and that I enjoy is you know, trying to encourage the next generation of young scientists that are coming forward. Science has is so powerful now that you many, many things are possible. But in the end it comes down to having the right ideas when to know to go into something and what you want to pursue. And so it comes down to what Francis Crick told me, because Francis Crick was at the Salk and I was there as well. I had all these great mentors. Yeah. Francis Crick, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA. One of the co-discoverers of the double helix. Uh, and, and he was known for being able to ask the right questions. Uh, and for me, that is, it's a very humbling lesson because you can ask many questions. There's hundreds of ways that you can be curious about things. But Francis would get down to what's what is, what's the key question? I don't want to have a good question or a pretty good question. What is the key question? Uh, and he had ways of distilling things and also pushing you and pushing me. Uh, I'd talk to him about certain things and he would give the good idea or it's Oh, wrong. <laughs> you should let someone else do that. Good <laughs> idea. Not for you. <laughs> so he was very helpful, actually. Uh, he, you know, he, 
all of these, the mentors that I had made me step up my game. And I, I think it's a, it's a good lesson for young people that are coming along. And there, there's so much to do. It's a great era in science. And so it still comes down to knowing what to ask. That's, that's going to be the key. Well, Professor Evans, thank you for leaving us with some words of wisdom. This has been a great conversation, and thank you so much. Allie, thank you very much for having me. Join us next time for more cutting-edge Salk science. At Salk, world-renowned scientists work together to explore big, bold ideas. From cancer to Alzheimer's, aging to climate change. Where Cures Begin is a production of the Salk Institute's Office of Communications. To learn more about the research discussed today, visit salk.edu slash podcast.